So, I'm delighted to be joined here by uh, Riz Ahmed, who you will know from his roles in Rogue One, Jason Bourne, and his, award, uh, his Emmy Award-winning role in The Night Of. Uh, you're also a rapper, Riz, as I understand, and um, part of the Sweatshop Boys. Um, <laughs> we also have uh, Ben Morris, who is the Oscar-winning creative director at Industrial Light and Magic, and has worked on visual effects for Gladiator, The Golden Compass, and Warhorse, among others. And we also have Neil Corbold, who is the special effects master behind Rogue One, Alien Covenant, Gladiator, and Gravity, and has two Oscars and four BAFTAs, as well as working with some of the best directors in, in the business. Uh, are those Oscars in your downstairs, Lou? Uh, no, no, they're on uh, they're on a shelf in my living room. I, I sometimes use them as dumbbells. <laughs> you actually uh, to, to keep my biceps. Why not? Um, Why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if we kick off with you, Riz, um, it's been quite a year for you so far. Uh, an Emmy Award, cover of Time magazine. Has it been a nice journey for you? Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, I guess. Um, I've been kind of. Uh, plugging away for, for quite a long time, working a lot of kind of smaller British independent films and um, Star Wars Rogue One is where I got to, we got to work together. Yeah. Um, was, was my first kind of big film, my first studio film. Um, and I guess it's kind of weird, it's like as big as you can possibly get, so everything's <laughs> just downhill from there. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, was, it was a really, it was a fascinating experience for me because I didn't have any other big films to compare it to. But now that I do, I'm realizing just how unique an experience it was. And I think of everything in, in the last kind of year or so that um, I've been lucky enough to kind of do, I think that was just a particularly special experience. Especially in what ways? How does it differ? Um, I think because it's something that you grow up watching. You grow up watching the Star Wars films and it's kind of like being welcomed into folklore. Um, in a weird way, you know, it's like a weird, uh, it's just a very surreal feeling in that sense. Um, and I guess also just having an action figure, which <laughs> is <just laughs> pretty cool. I mean, before that, I had to make my own action figures of myself. I, I bought you But they, yeah. yeah, I used to sell them online myself. But yeah. Do you find that people treat you differently, uh, you know, since they've seen you in Star Wars than they did before? You know, like kids in the street and stuff. I guess more people are kind of passively aware of your face, like they've seen your face on the side of a Kleenex box or something <laughs> like that. I think that's the big difference <laughs> with Star Wars. There's you know you've so made it when you're on the side of a Kleenex box. There's just so box. much kind of, uh, I don't know what you call it, what's kind of ambient advertising yeah. that it's just, even if people haven't seen the film, they kind of look at you and they think, mate, I know you from somewhere. And at that point, you can start um, ha really having fun and pretending that they know you from places that they don't. <laughs> you lie to them. <laughs> Always good. Um, do you find the same thing that when people know that you've been involved in in Star Wars, they there's a certain reverence that comes with that? The, uh, a absolutely. I mean, it's a perk of the job. You get to. I, I'll admit it. I was seven years old and I watched the first Star Wars film, and I, I looked at the cinema screen and I said to my parents, "I want to do that." And I'm lucky enough to have, I'm a bit older than that now, uh, made it. But uh, no, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I know what you mean about saying it's a part of uh, popular culture. It's, it's almost legendary. And, and I, I'm sure Neil and Riz have both experienced it. You sometimes stand on set and you look around and you just think, I'm in Star Wars. This is absolutely bonkers. I'm making the next Star Wars film. And then whenever you, somebody sort of, realizes that they immediately ask you questions that you can't give any answers to <laughs> like <laughs> so what's in the next the star wars <laughs> that's the terrible <laughs> bit yeah yeah i'm quite intrigued about how you all started your careers because you started back in on superman in the 70s 78 yeah um uh, i i managed to get my, my uncle was a supervisor on superman the movie and uh, i bugged him for weeks and weeks to take me into the set and eventually he he did and i went in there for um one weekend on a Saturday when they were filming. My first vision of a film set was the Fortress of Solitude and Christopher Reeves flying down the, the length of the, of the 007 stage at Pinewood. And as soon as I saw that, I didn't see any wires, I just saw this man flying in a Superman costume and uh, I realized that's, that's what I want to do. So they <coughs> went back to school, got a, um, a work experience with my uncle, uh, which was supposed to be a day a week 
Um, but I sort of flipped it around. I went to school for a day and I went to work for a week. So. How did your teachers feel about that? Um, they, they kept saying that I probably wouldn't make anything of my life and I wasn't studying hard enough. But I'd already got a job at that point. So, you know, I just wanted to give it my all. And, and uh, I went back for my exams. I, I, you know, I did all right. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, but you're, you're really at the very top of your game now. How long did it take... To, to really establish yourself in, 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 in your job? In, in special effects, because it's a very physical thing, we, you know, we do a lot of, of dangerous stuff, you know, explosives and stuff like that. Um, our training to be a special effects supervisor is over 15 to 20 years. So it's like five years as a trainee, five years as a technician, five years as a senior technician before you can even look at becoming a supervisor. So, it, and you've got to do a certain amount of hours or weeks within those years. So, you know, I think a special effects supervisor, you have to do 600 weeks of actual physical work. And what kind of things are you doing in that physical work? It's, it's anything from, from a wet down to, to pick the light up on, on a night scene to, to blowing the big spaceship up with Riz in it on Rogue One. Um, <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, to, to, to some big hydraulic... Um, motion bases that you know that are 60 foot long and you know 10 foot high and 30 feet wide of uh, like the, the Superman returns crash where the plane crashes you know we've built a full-size uh, replica of a triple seven aeroplane and flipped it over on its side and had the axes rolling around inside it amazing stuff but how about you Riz did you did you always want to be an actor um I always kind of enjoyed performing. I was always kind of a bit of a kind of class clown and um, used to get into a lot of trouble at school for it until one of the teachers took me to one side and said, if you want to muck about and do it on stage and you get a round of applause <laughs> instead of a detention. <laughs> so I thought I was, I wasn't fully convinced and then I went and, um, and yeah, I guess got, got to start doing the school play and we got to do our school plays with the girls school so that was game over at that point. <laughs> and I was like, this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I guess it, it, for me, it was just a real outlet. It was a real outlet for kind of just a kid that was a bit, over, a bit hyperactive, really. So it kind of kept me out of trouble and, and you know, channeled things into a more productive route. So did you always know that you wanted to do it seriously? No, I mean, I think, I think a lot of us can relate to that feeling of where you kind of internalize some of the limitations people place on you you know mm. for you Neil there was something inside your heart that just told you even though there's not a massive chance of me succeeding at this difficult kind of career you pursued it mm. and that's amazing and that's to your yeah. credit and I think that for me I just didn't take seriously my chances of being an actor I think mainly because I don't know maybe possibly you know you had an uncle in the business you yeah. thought okay if I've got an uncle in the business maybe I can do it I didn't really have anyone that I could relate to that I was really seeing on screen. I didn't see myself reflected back in the culture. And so you start to internalize some of those limitations that people place on you. And it was actually just a completely random email from another student at Oxford um, who wasn't even a close friend of mine who just emailed me and said, look, everyone's applying for their jobs now. I hope you're gonna pursue the acting because I've seen you in a couple of plays at uni. And um, no one else really I knew had thought to tell, give me that encouragement. And it was so weird, just that one little nudge, I thought, oh, I'll apply to one drama school, see if I get in. Got in, couldn't afford it. I'll apply to one scholarship fund, see if I get it. I got it. Even as I was leaving drama school, I was like, I'm just gonna be playing cab driver number two <laughs> all day. So <laughs> I don't wanna do that. So I just thought, oh, forget this. I'll probably get a law conversion. And just then, I, a, a casting director spotted me, a photo of me, and I resembled someone, and I played a true, a true life story film, and that was my break. So a lot of things had to go right that could have easily gone wrong. Um, and it kind of makes me shudder to think of all the talent that we're missing out on that don't get that encouragement. So if you see someone, <coughs> a young person, you think they've got potential in what they do, tell them, because they might not be aware of that themselves. Sitting from where you are now, yeah, I agree. Well done. Yes, I agree. Sitting from where you are now, looking back at that email that, that, that you were sent, have you told the person who sent it to you how much it meant? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I shout her out and mention her the whole time. She's actually emailed me and said, could you stop mentioning me? <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to go about my life. <laughs> we weren't even that close. <laughs> 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 right. 
but you saved me. She's like, leave me alone, <laughs> blocked. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> my life. How yeah. about you, Ben? Did you feel that you fought against those kind of internal limitations? Um, I, the first road barrier I hit was that, that back in the 70s. There, there, there wasn't a clear route to how to join the film industry. I didn't necessarily, I didn't have the benefit of a family connection. And the first, you go to the careers officer in your school and they say, so what do you want to be? You could be a doctor, you could be a this, you could be a farmer, you could... And I said, oh, I want to be a special effects guy. And they just look at you like, you're mad. And then, and then you go, yeah, and then I think I want to take science and art. And the careers and the, the timetable people just go, nah, it's never going to work. <laughs> we can't work that through. And, and so what, I, I, have, I think we've all got similar stories. There's, mm. I, I went to... I just kept making small films on my own, Super 8 cameras. I used to build models, blow them up in my garden, mm. make stop motion <laughs> animation, sort of morph and plasticine in the bedroom. I was a bit of a sort of nerd like that. And, uh, and then I just, um, I pushed through and did take art and went to an art college and then did an engineering degree. And it wasn't until I got, uh, I went to a BFI talk by the Henson company, Jim Henson, who made the Muppets. And they had a, a group in London called The Creature Shop who'd done films like Labyrinth and Dark Crystal and Ninja Turtles and stuff like that. And I just went along on spec to a, an open talk. And uh, at the end of it, I just walked up and I said, hey, I really want to do what, what you guys do. And amazingly, they sat there and said, well, come on up to Camden and uh, come, come and see. And, uh, and uh, I owe my career to those guys, John Stevenson and Dave Hausman. And, uh, from there, it just went on, and I, I, I started in the physical side uh, of the industry, and then I moved over. I went and saw that every every now and then I, I was sort of keep, well, I watched every film I possibly could, but I suddenly saw Jurassic Park. I think it was Jurassic Park. Terminator Two was impressive as well, but Jurassic Park. I just sat and watched the Tyrannosaurus Rex tear tear apart that Jeep, and I just thought, oh my goodness, I've got to retrain. So, uh, and I pushed over into computer graphics, but. I would agree, the, the, the people who get into our industry, and it's a really fun industry to be in, they've just got a determination, but nearly everyone's got a string of very lucky moments where they manage to get in there, and, and, and I, I agree. You've got, to, you've got to try and bring people into the industry, and we do that all the time. The way that you turned from sort of sp uh, special effects to visual effects it, it, it kind of uh, it highlights a point that I wanted to raise actually because until I started researching for this interview I hadn't quite realised that they were completely different departments that special effects and visual effects were, were quite so separate yeah um, but you often work together on similar films yeah I mean there's normally a special effects and a visual effects supervisor on, on, on all the movies most of them unless it's a talking head movie yeah, um, and then it's just them guys putting set extensions on, <laughs> um, but and, and we get together right at the beginning, you know, in the planning uh, stages. We we'll all sit around uh, in a room and uh, we'll we'll have a script and we'll basically figure out between us, we, you know, with the director, we'll give him ideas of, of you know, oh, well I can do this practically, you know, like a a car chase, you know, I can do the car on a rig if a, if the actor can't drive or whatever, and then you know. Uh, ben can then put the, the background in and, and, yeah. and that sort of if the car has to flip over you know we can do a practical rig for inside the car and then outside the car is a full visual effects I um, think it, and it's a big collaboration it's like a it's a soup at the beginning of a film you've got a script hopefully yeah. sometimes you don't have a script and then you've just got a bunch of talented people who have all got specialist skills sitting there sort of coming to the table and saying and in, including the actors saying how are we going to make this and quite often you've nearly all what we always nearly I, I want can you do something that I've never seen before <laughs> yeah. and that's like oh my god here we go yeah. okay and uh, and then you just work your way through it and you come up with the ideas and there's a lot of artists involved yeah. as well and uh, so and I think um, the visual effects to, to speak to visual effects there are massive effects I, I I think there are two categories of what we do there's the stuff that you just know isn't real aliens don't need well, maybe they do. Aliens don't, as far as we know, <laughs> exist. Spaceships don't regularly land in London and blow up bridges or stuff like that. And then there's the stuff that no hopefully nobody ever sees. And that's where we can change the time of day, the weather. We can get rid of the old wrinkle on somebody's face or blemish that might be there. Uh, we can paint out wires on stunts. And so you, n nowadays on a big film in visual effects, we'll support and help and assist makeup departments, costume departments, special effects, yeah. uh, camera departments, everyone. And you end up 
nearly touching every frame of the film, uh, just in different ways. So, uh, and it's it's quite satisfying doing both, to be honest. If if you walk out of the film and you don't know there were visual effects in it, I'm I'm actually quite happy. Mm. <laughs> mm. Job done well. Yeah. yeah. Now you mentioned Jurassic Park earlier, but I, I wonder is there a film that really stands out for you as something that really kind of marked a change in the the introduction of technology into filmmaking? I think Gravity was one of those which movies. Which you worked on. Which I worked and on. And won an Oscar for. And won an Oscar <laughs> for, yeah. I mean, you know, my, my, my time on that was o over two years, um, on and off. It was, you know, Alfonso was probably on it four or five years um, all the time. Um, you know, literally, I, I couldn't stay on it all the ho for the whole movie because I'd probably been bankrupt by now because it, there was so many... It was such a difficult movie to, to make, you know, when we first, when we first sat down for the first time, and Alfonso gave this um, his vision of what he wanted, we all just like looked at one another and thought, "How the hell are we going to do that?" And then he said, "I want it all practical. I want these massive sets, 60 foot long, revolving round. I want the actress to come down on you know in, in zero g." And then we went off again and scratched our heads, and you know we had to come to this realization that. We can't do it practically. You know, it's just it, it's not cost effective. Um, you know, it would take too much time to film it, and to be honest, it probably wouldn't look that good either. You know, it, it, so it, the the uh, after probably about eight months, I suppose, it came to the point where we're we're just going to film their heads. So basically, one of my jobs was really to move the actors around in this thing called the light box with a robotic camera moving them, all, you know, literally they would stand in it, would strap them in and it would spin this way, it would tilt them forward, they'd be all over the place while the camera's doing the same, same sort of move as well. So, you know, it, 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 it was a lot of planning, a lot of technology that didn't exist, that <laughs> had to be, you know, the robot cameras were very new at that point. Um, we went out to San Francisco to a company called Bot & Dolly that were doing some some commercials that were basically photographing like that microphone and doing some funky moves around it for us to then take it, put it on a track, you know, 50, 60 foot long, flying it towards Sandra Bullock at 60 miles an hour and stopping an inch from her nose and that sort of thing. So it's quite exciting stuff. Imagining the insurance. Oh, that. yes, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, we have uh, some f uh, a little video, in fact, of uh, that you sent us a little uh, series of clips from films that you've worked on that I think we can play in the background if that's okay, ABT. Um, but I might ask you the same question, Riz, actually. Is there a film that really stood out in your mind? I think so. I think it's going to go on for five minutes, so it's, gonna, it's, just, to, it's just to add, oh, right. add texture. Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> I mean, you can talk us through if there's any bits that you want to point I'll out for us. <laughs> So, I mean, th this, this was a, a mixture. So, when he was in the car, we built all the cars. Um, and uh, as the car went out, visual effects took it over and span it round. So, yeah. Well, was there a film that stood out for you, Riz? Uh, you know, watching it sort of as a, as a punter, even, that you thought, wow, this is. Do you remember being really impressed by the kind by of effect? You mean visual effects yeah. or just as a film? By visual effects. I think for me, actually, now that you mention it, I've realized Jurassic Park was a game changer as well. Yeah. And it's also because, I don't know if, um, if many other people can relate to this, but I was obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid. I think a lot of kids kind of mm. are, aren't they? Yeah. Um, well they were in my day. Now they're obsessed <laughs> with their phones. But it's like, I was just so into dinosaurs. And they had never been brought to life like that before. No. And it just blew my mind. Yeah, I think that was a that was a massive one for me. Um, I yeah. think yeah, and it was the way they moved. And and the the great thing I've got to be honest in that film, the great thing was it was a mixture of puppets. It wasn't all in the computer, but it was just the perfect mix. And I think that's what Mr. Spielberg is a master of, is knowing when to use one technique like Neil's mm -hmm. practical techniques versus a computer graphic technique. And there were only. I think nowadays we do 2,000 shots in a film in visual effects. In that, there were only 40, I think there were 40 or 50 computer graphic shots in the entire film. Wow. And yet, it feels like the whole film is just constantly dinosaurs. It's not. It's yeah. just brilliant pieces of filmmaking. 
And he, Stephen, one of the things he does is he, lo- he often doesn't show the event, he shows the reaction on the actor's face. And that, that's an incredibly powerful thing. It lets you think about what that person's seeing and you can put the picture in there. And that's an incredibly strong way of making films. It, it, it also throws the challenge at the actors because quite often you guys, unfortunately, are just looking at a green wall or a ping pong ball or, so, or something and having to sort of imagine what's there. So, uh, but but it, it's, it's a sign of good filmmaking that you, you don't have to overload with uh, visual effects all the time. Mm. Actually, picking up on that point, um, how difficult is it uh, sort of working in that environment where you are acting to a ping pong ball? I think it's, um, it's actually a really mixed experience in terms of sometimes having to do a lot of the kind of imaginative work yourself. But very often, particularly on a film like Star Wars, and particularly when you've got these guys you know, helping you out, up, everything up until that point has been, so much of the work has been done for you. So for example, on Rogue One, there's a, there's a moment where um, a run out of this kind of underground cave network and a mountainous kind of desert planet and come to the edge of uh, a slope and look out into the distance to see that this Death Star is literally destroying the planet that I'm stood on <laughs> and uh, destroying my home city, right? Um, that's not an experience I can draw on, personally. <laughs> <laughs> right? It came close when Boris Johnson was mayor. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> I was... It was a bit tricky just watching the thing, and it's very... It's a tricky thing to, to try and channel, like... And you're not exactly... Then they go, okay, you know, that was great. You cried your eyes out on that one. You were looking in the wrong place, though. You got to look <laughs> just down to your right a little bit, like this. So th- that is challenging. But having said that, the stuff that they are cutting to is mind-blowing yeah. and is magical. And what you realize is when these guys are building such an effective world around you, it, it's not on you to try and project that image or do that work. It's the trust that that image will be there and the audience will, will see that image. It's, as you say, to just to try your, your best to imagine what it would be. Yeah. And so sometimes when you're acting in a void, you end up kind of pushing and trying to... But once you've seen enough of what these guys do, you can kind of relax and go, now that will take care of itself. Just worry about what you're doing. But on the flip side, you have some experiences, like for example, on the cargo ship for Rogue One. I mean, these guys put it up on the most incredible rig. It was like, so um, Gareth, the director, he said, look, I want to be able to point the camera anywhere. I want to be able to be in there film it handheld and Rogue One was kind of had this distinctive tone where there was a lot of handheld work that was scrappy and gritty he wants to be in there with us and be able to just shoot in any direction mm-hmm. and it's and the whole thing's alive now obviously props department set mm-hmm. design all these guys they build this incredible spaceship the costume everything's down to a T but then what they had is they had the spaceship up on a rig mm-hmm. so when it was steering left and steering right it was moving we would know where it would move so all those reactions, I mean, so much of that work is done for you. Mm. Wouldn't have been able to do that, you know, not so long ago. And on the outside, rather than just have green screens, you guys had some crazy yeah. wraparound giant um, cinema yeah. screens. It's probably yeah. one of the biggest li- at that time, um, li- like you said, rock concerts, but it was like a, almost like a huge horseshoe, probably about 150 foot long yeah. Yeah. And, and probably 40 foot high. And um, the visual effects guys did a. Um, they, w- they weren't plates, I don't think. I think they were. No, no, computer they generated animation of going through yeah. clouds and deserts, and so all the light uh, uh, reactions with uh, interactions with the with the actors was was real. Yeah. So if they're going through clouds, it, you know, the the lights changing, and uh, if they're going through the, if, you know, if, if they change direction and the sun starts off over here and they do, do a left hand turn the sun changes with the light and it, mm. it's very effective and some of that stuff they got in camera you know it's just like yeah. you you catch a little glimpse out the window and it, you're not seeing a green screen you're seeing a bit of the desert or the sky or yeah it, wor- it works really well so is the main purpose for that then to uh, I- in terms of lighting on the actors faces or is it to, to make the experience more real for the actors I in the moment i think you get both you, you honestly get both. One of the biggest challenges for us when we're trying to pull all of the amazing stuff into the computer and put it all together in layers, one of the biggest challenges is if 
the lighting doesn't feel right. And I don't know, I mean, you guys have probably seen the odd film or shot where you kind of go, that looks a bit fake. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> everyone just goes, it's CG. Well, it often it isn't. It's <laughs> <laughs> but one of the really subtle things is as humans, we know what the world around us looks like. And really subtle things like light direction and all stuff like that. And so if we separate a shot up and say, OK, we're going to film the foreground in a car or a spaceship, but the light that's coming in the windows isn't the light that is finally created in the background. It all breaks, and, and it's a hell on earth for us. <laughs> and so yeah. we're sitting. So it, it solves that problem, and we can actually, the, the rigs that uh, Neil and you guys were using, well, they also had control panels. So if there was a laser flight going on outside the X wings, you literally had, we had an iPad with laser bolts, and you could literally play it like a game and go, laser, 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 <laughs> and the flashes would come past. And in the old days, we'd actually have to do that afterwards and put flashes onto people's faces or the goggles in the, the X-Wing or Y-Wing uh, or U-Wing pilots, um, they'd, they'd have the wrong reflections on the faces. So we'd often not be able to put the reflection, uh, the, sorry, the goggles on because you'd see the green screen or a camera assistant with his uh, <laughs> focus pulling. With these big screens, you get perfect reflections. Uh, and then the last thing is you can actually say to the actor, and we did it on gravity mm -hmm. as well. Um, you can say, yeah, yeah, the spaceship, you can see it, it's over there. And they can actually watch something dynamically move. And so you're actually talking the same lam language. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a massive breakthrough. And I think as a technology, that's just gonna get, I mean, this is an LED screen here. It's gonna get more and more prevalent in what we do. And it means that you can walk off as the screens get finer resolution and the quality of the image that we can put on them gets better, it actually means that we'll be able to walk off of the film set with shots that are already in the bag. Uh, we don't have to fiddle with them afterwards. And that, that's a massive deal. So we actually have some clips from Rogue One as well, I think, if we can play those. But that, that example, that spaceship scene that you're, you're describing, is something that's a real collaboration between all three, right? So, mm. you know, yeah. the special it's effects. It's on this reel, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So talk us through this, actually, then. Talk us through which bit fits into which department. This is visual effects. That's all him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was done in the studio, ILM studio in London. Uh, supervisor was a guy called Moen, and um, Moen Leo. But this, a lot of this material is based on footage that was uh, shot out in Jordan, so, uh, and also stages that were built in Pinewood. So a lot of these back plates were using practical elements and real locations, and then we augmented that with CG. Um, this is the Death Star which uh, is slowly building itself. <laughs> How long does something like that take? Uh, it, can take it can take weeks or months to put together. Um, and this is obviously us creating Peter Cushing for, uh, for his Moff Tarkin scenes. And that was a huge challenge, a huge challenge. Um, and how are things, oh sorry, please go. No, no, I, I just, just to um, say, this is biased heavily towards visual effects, but there are some moments in here where you'll see the work that Neil did, both practically on the beach scenes, uh, where there was lots of practical pyro and fighting, and also the, um, the big gimbal rigs that Neil created. Mm. Um, there, there used to be a time as well where the visual effects Canary would say, War. sorry, we don't want any <laughs> smoke, we don't want any smoke in the shot because we can't, play with it, but on, on Rogue One, the John Null, who was the visual effects supervisor, said, you know, knock your heart out, just yeah. do, do whatever you want, put as much smoke, as many explosions as you can in. So this uh, is a Why, what changed? People can, can I deal think it's just the technology that's available now to, to, you know, it adds to, you know, they can put their the visual effects in between the smoke and yeah. and blend it in much better now, whereas before it, you, you, saw, you saw edges, but not so much now. Um, it feels like, you know, sort of from a, from a viewer's perspective, it feels like things have swung very heavily in favour. Sorry, we're just no, coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just watching telly. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's just to, to show Neil's rig. I think it pops up any second. Mm. Anyway, keep going. Um, it feels like things thing have sort of swung very much in favour of computer-generated graphics for a while, and then they, it feels like they've almost swung back a bit. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it felt like a, a new toy in the arsenal. And, and you could argue that a few years ago it was used too much. Mm. And I think now, now we're using everything for the right reason. It's not just because it's the new toy in the toy box and like, hey, we're going to use it for everything. And, um, and I think now, um, I mean, as a visual effects guy, it, gives me, it pays my mortgage. But I, if somebody said to me, do you want to film in a green box for the next six weeks? 
Or do you want us to build a beautiful piece of set that everyone can relate to, camera people can find their compositions, actors can actually get some sense of the space? God, I'd far <coughs> rather do that and just enhance that. Um, the idea of sort of being in that abstract green box, you, you kind of get like cabin fever. You kind of, oh Christ, what are we doing this morning? It's mm. still green. <laughs> um, and there's something really exciting uh, when we work about moving the entire film crew to the next stage and you turn up and it's mm. like you're, you're going into another world and you get to investigate it all and you, you get to understand you could be in a desert one day, move three sheds down the road and you're in a jungle. And, yeah. and that, that, that's fantastic. Yeah. So isn't, that, isn't that also part of why, I mean, if you have no limitations and set no parameters going into any creative endeavor, whatever you know, anyone here kind of does, when they kind of come out with ideas, then you're kind of lost. Yeah. But if you make certain decisions and you plant a flag, yeah. and certain things are very hard to change once you've set down that road, it suddenly really opens up so many possibilities. If you, you need a frame to paint inside, and I think that's what physical sets can really do. Yeah. Because the time and money and the fact that they are, they are usefully cumbersome yeah. in that sense. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. like, all right, we're kind of stuck with that. So now how mm. do we kind of fill things in around this frame? And obviously, hopefully you don't feel stuck with it. It's something that's no, no. wonderful and brings things to life. But you need those, you need something solid to build things on, otherwise it's, it could, you know. Yeah, and, and it's just green screen, they'll just be telling you, actually no, it's red, it's blue. It's like, well no, it won't match with what we've built, so that's what it is, Yeah. so we'll go from there. And I, and I think even going to real locations as well, I mean, in fact, you guys went to the Seychelles? You had a, or was it? Maldives. The Maldives, Maldives. Yeah. that was a really it's tough hell. shoot, it's that one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend going. Uh, but but you you are. Are. <laughs> they're joking, but in the Maldives, it was like 40 degrees here, oh. Mosquito Central. <laughs> Uh, I didn't actually go, I'm just bitter. So oh, that's no, 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 excellent. <laughs> they told me it was rubbish, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I, I, and I would say, we, um, f on Force Awakens, it was the same thing. We, we, I did go on that, and I was really lucky. We got to go into the deep desert in the Middle East, uh, just on the border of Saudi Arabia. And it's, it makes everybody react differently to what's going on. You're sitting there, 52 degree heat, sweltering. You don't know what's going on. The actors, John Boyega, dressed as a stormtrooper, just... It's not sprayed on sweat. He's literally just gallons of water pouring out of him. But everybody's in the zone. And, and it just w looks and feels real. And you can then, that, that grounds the whole sequence potentially. And then you can jump back and do pickups or mm. other stuff that can be in a more controlled space in a studio. But I, going on location is just a fantastic way of bringing something to the film. Mm. I've got a question, <laughs> which is, you guys keep saying that, listen, you need to ground things in the authenticity yeah. of, of things that are real and tangible. Grand Moff Tarkin, Peter Cushing, in that, yeah. in that sequence, I, I, we were discussing before, mm. is one of the kind of only examples I can think of um, where you've created a, uh, an actor's performance yeah. completely from CGI, yeah. but it is passed off to much of the public as an, actual, as an actor. When you see... Andy Serkis doing Gollum, yeah, yeah. there's a level of awareness that creatures like that don't exist. Human mm. beings exist. Even Benjamin Button, it's like, okay, human beings don't age in reverse. We understand yeah, yeah. there's some magic even though we invest in it. When you're just creating a character, a living, breathing human being from scratch, I went to see the film with people who weren't aware that that actor had passed away. Yeah. And they did not bat an eyelid. They were like, that, who, was that, who was that guy? Yeah, yeah, the old guy. Why isn't he at the cast party? <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. So this terrifies me mm. because are you going to replace actors? Oh, that's the million dollar <laughs> question. Absolutely no. That is not. Well, I, you, I, I mean, you've taken the, the first step. No, no. <laughs> the, and now that was a, a d d People often say, what's the hardest thing you can possibly do? And the hardest, th the thing that we all know so well, better than anything else in the world is other people. And that's why it's the hardest thing in the world. And I would sit there and say, if anybody said to me, can you just create digital actors? The answer is, but what's, why? Because we've got actors, we've got people, wh wh why? And I think in yeah. the case of Moff Tarkin, there was a damn good reason why. He was part of a story, he wasn't around anymore. But to actually sit there and just say, actors are gonna be replaced, it, it'll never happen. I don't know if they'll be replaced. I don't know, well, listen, thank you for the, uh, <laughs> for the encouragement. <laughs> I won't throw in the towel just yet and yeah, tangle no, my no. CV. But th I do think that we're living in an age now where we understand the power of like 
brands that persist. And you know what happens to actors? They get old, they quit, oh. they become difficult, whatever. Like they're human beings, all the foibles of human beings. And one thing that I'm really interested to see was on Instagram, there are kind of a couple of avatar models and yeah. singers and pop stars yeah. that are not human beings. They've been lovingly created by digital artists yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? and VFX people. And it's interesting, some people know it's not a real person, some people really don't, but they're very popular. They have millions of followers, they have teams behind them making music, and we're seeing the birth of virtual pop stars. I think as a stepping stone, I don't know if anyone's seen that Marlon Brando film, Talk To Me Marlon. Anyone seen that? It basically takes video recordings of Marlon Brando's own audio cassettes, and it opens with him saying, I just had my whole head scanned for Superman. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just had my whatever yes. you were there when that yeah, went down. That, yeah, that was in, yeah seventies. Yeah. Right, and he said I've just had my whole head scanned. They asked me to make every expression so that they could emulate it, and I see that this is where it's going. It's interesting in that documentary. Mm. It's digital Marlon mm. saying that to you. Yeah. So it's the fulfillment of that prophecy. I would pay a lot. Of, I would pay money to go and see if you and yeah. you got together and said we're bringing them back Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando is going to be in the next whatever movie. Who here wouldn't go to see that? Yeah. I'd go well, to see it. Yeah. But and so I'm just saying, even though you're being all nice here right now, <laughs> I can <laughs> see the daggers <laughs> on the nice. Look, the honest and truth I see is, you I, coming. I, I heard there, I mean, there are even companies, I've heard there are companies who are considering setting up. So it's for, for actors to be able to uh, basically capture themselves in their prime and know that if they ever need to go back there, that they, they can always be recreated yeah. there. Image and writing. Yeah, 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 You're living absolutely. image writing. Image. And, yeah, and that's the thing. But yeah. I don't think you, you, you never capture the performance. That's, no. that's the, the beauty of actors is that, you know, every, every, from what I see, every character you play is different. And, and you know, I think with a CG, it would, you wouldn't get that. You would just... Yeah. I also think people so they've like promised live on stage yeah. in front of everyone here. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Do that. I yeah, don't like CD. I, I'm a practical guy. I like, oh, right. yeah, I like blowing things up and uh, smoke and wind and rain and all that <laughs> stuff. In terms of that balance, though, between sort of the, the, the real kind of created side and the more human side, do you have a preference between working on, on films where there's, you know, lots of visual effects or films like, or, or, or series like The Night Of, where it's very kind of real? Do you have a preference in, in different environments? You know, the funny thing is, it's always a marriage of, of the, um, the technical and the untechnical or the imaginary and the tangible it always is so you might think this say for example a drama like the night of which is very much kind of people in a room talking yeah where's the vfx where's the special effects in that it's interesting because something that we didn't think about when they were when they were putting that set together is they tried to make it as authentic as possible and realistic as possible so everything down to the distance between the prison bars was exactly Problem is, that distance is such that it's very hard to see to both your eyes <laughs> through the prison bars unless you're at a very particular angle. So you would think that that must be a much more free process, but here I am on Rogue One in a completely live, uh, rigged spaceship where I can see exploding cities out the window. And here I am talking to John Turturro in the night of, having to not, be, not being able to look at him, but having to look slightly to the right <laughs> with my head angled just like that without <laughs> moving it and down like this and talking to him like that and I can't move from that angle because of the way the prison bars would block out one or the other eye. <laughs> so it's, it's always unexpected yeah. what the technical aspects are even on a very low budget film. It's just very small things. So there's, that's always part of the process and again I think that those limitations somehow create very interesting performances. I'm quite a hyperactive guy. My performance in the night of would have been probably something very different if those prison bars <laughs> didn't mean <laughs> that I am stuck in like frozen <laughs> psycho mode. And it does something else to the performance. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's limitation. Just going back to what you said about uh, stopping a, a, a rig just a few centimeters away from Sod Bullock's face. Has anyone ever asked you to do some unusual requests because of special effects? Doing, doing what you mean? Well, if you didn't sort of, you know, flipped upside down and all of that kind of thing. Um, I guess being blown up in a spaceship is weird. Yeah. <laughs> bullet hits. We did a load of bullet hits around you on the on the. Do you know, what? I've got a bone to pick with you <laughs> 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 about <laughs> this because um, see, there's this backpack that I wear in the film. 
why couldn't we make that pretend heavy? Oh, that wasn't Why did that have to be so <laughs> heavy? No, that was, no, that was costume. That was costume. Props. 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 <laughs> props. It was like we would have made it lightweight if we'd built it. Uh, yeah, I was like, this looks amazing. So I've got to run, <laughs> jump, dive, do squats, crawl around in the sand with this, put it on. It was like yeah. 55 kilos. Yes, yeah, it's like running around with a bag of potatoes on your back. It was yeah. mental. <laughs> That was, was enough. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any particularly unusual uh, setups that you've been part of creating in the past that you were like, well, is this going to work? Um, not really. I mean, it's, I think some of the trickier ones were like the beach landing on Private Ryan. You know, um, Stephen literally turned up a day before we started filming. We did a lot of video conference when it was in its early stages. You know, like we'd all have to come up to London We'd sit in the office b until they got the satellite link, and then Stephen would lark around for ten minutes before before we actually spoke, and we only had ten minutes on the whole uh, call. But he 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 um he literally came, and then we set up a load of tests for him on the beach. So it was like this was the bullet hits, these were the explosions, this is the smoke, this is the black smoke, this is the flamethrower, and. Uh, we got to the end of it and he said, I like it, and I, but I want 10 times as much. And how long was this before the shoot? This is a day before we started shooting. So I remember turning around to the producer and going, I haven't got enough. I haven't got enough bullet hits. So he said, well, you better get some more then. <laughs> but it literally, you know, we were shooting documentary style, five or six cameras, handheld, um, um, and he basically wanted bullet hits from when he s uh, shouted action to when he sh shouted cut. Smoke, bullet hits, explosions, and it just, you know, we had hours and hours of rushes ev every day, dailies that we had to go and see. Um, you know, so we'd finish work at six and we'd be watching dailies till 10 o'clock at night. Um, we had two crews, we had a crew rigging during the night, ready for the morning. So we had 20 people working at night, digging the beach up and putting individual bullet hits into the ground putting lightweight sand and stuff on top of them and mm -hmm. and choreogra choreographing actors through this mayhem it, you know we had you know five six seven big actors that had to run and we and we had to try and not blow them up on purpose what would happen if you got hit by one of those bullet hits um it's not, it doesn't hurt that much i've been hit by <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we just we just blame it on the other person. <laughs> just say on the props department. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you both worked together on Gladiator as well, is that right? We yeah we didn't know we we weren't as friendly as we are now. But yeah. We, yeah we we did. Uh, when was that? Two. Uh, Ninety eight. Something yeah. like that. No, no. I, I can't remember. It's, it's like so far in the past. I I, I remember turning up and. I, d I, I was working for a company in London called The Mill or Mill Film and uh, we turned up in Bourne Wood which is a place just out in Surrey and it's a forestry commission piece of land and actually if you watch films and you know you're Bourne Wood it's in a lot of films yeah. anyway I turned up and Neil and his guys had set the German battle scene so you know where all the Romans are out there and the guy comes in with his head and then you, you'd plumbed flames into the yeah, entire did, yeah. forest hadn't you? Yeah. And yeah, then we, we stuck a kilometre of pipework into the into the forest there. Yeah. Um, we had we had three forty foot gas tankers yeah. uh, out the back, and we were pumping. And do you know what? We couldn't set fire to the forest. We put thousands I and thousands of. I remember a moment where they shouted "cut" and the trees kept going. <laughs> it, was, no, it was later no, in the day. I remember we that. Tried. <laughs> It was, it was, it was <laughs> Why are you admitting this? They were going to they were going <laughs> to cut the trees down anyway. That's the great thing about this place. It's a commission, so they they um, yeah. they, they, they we bought us we to bought do the trees. So. Yeah, but I did I did cut a fire lane around the just in case. Yeah, were there bits of gladiator from your side that were particularly tricky? Because I guess the technology wasn't quite as good then. No, it wasn't. And um, I, I would say for me, gladiator is one. Of, you, you talk about which films do you want to work on. I think we all just want to work on good films. It doesn't matter whether there's visual effects in there or not, or special effects. It's mm -hmm. just like walking out of a satisfying film where you can proudly say to your friends, that was a great movie. And Gladiator, to me, is one of those where you just walk out and go, yes, and you can still watch. But it was, it was the early days of producing thousands of digital people. Uh, we had to build the Colosseum, which was a vast piece of architecture. And although they built two thirds of the lower perimeter yeah, in Malta, in Valletta. Full size. Full size, full size yeah. yeah, and the the first two tiers, I think it was. 
Yeah. Um, and so it, it was a really big job and, and uh, we did a mixture. It wasn't all digital humans. Uh, we actually dressed ourselves in togas and went down to the basement of our building and videoed ourselves to make tiny little cards. <laughs> we, had to we had these togas that had different, they had um, very unique colored stripes on and the in the computer we could say, okay, turn that green stripe red for those 10,000 people, turn that green stripe blue for them. And so we're, wow. all, we're, we're all starring, which is about that big <laughs> in the Colosseum. But there's thousands of there's you. There's thousands of us. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing about a show like that for me was just really interesting is getting to talk to historians because uh, it's not a fantasy film. You're recreating some of the past and actually learning about the whole amphitheatre and how the sunshades used to come over the Valerium and all of that stuff. We actually built that into the models which is amazing. Mm. Um, so I think it was early days, but I think it was a fantastic film. And again, it was a good mix. Um, I look back at it now and you, you can feel the age of it. But the, the hardest shot in the movie is the one where they all walk out and the camera just doesn't stop circling round. And that, for us, the technical challenge on that was trying to work out what the camera was doing because you couldn't lock onto anything. You were looking at sky and spears and people's heads. So for us to work out how to put the Colosseum in behind that, uh, that, that small group of soldiers was a nightmare. Mm. It took about s took, uh, six to nine months to make that shot. Goodness. Which is crazy. Is, is your job easier now that technology is better, or is it just that the challenges have changed? I think it's the same with a lot of things. So things that used to be a problem in the past are easier, but every, every project we hit, people want more. We want to mm. push the bar more. So the tools and tools are more powerful. I think it's called Murphy's Law or something, but ba <laughs> basically um, we're, we're always pushing the tools. We very rarely sit there and say, ah, it's a dead cert, we know how, we know how to do this one. Um, so, but it does take a lot of time and wh when we have thousands and thousands of process cores working nonstop 24 seven doing computational maths, doing all sorts of stuff to make one pixel and, and people don't realize that a two and a half second shot in a film could have taken Neil and his department mm. two, three weeks to yeah. prep and it takes us anything up to, on a big shot, it can take anything up to six months and 20 people solid. And you, you watch the film, it's like zoop, boom, yeah. done. <laughs> it's quite like, oh, <laughs> that was six <laughs> months. But it, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not magic. Well, there's some of it's magic, but it's a lot of hard work as well. Yeah, of course. Now, we also have a clip uh, from The Force Awakens, uh, which we're going to play in the background, hopefully. Uh, while we're waiting for that, oh, no, it's here. There we go. So, actually, um, can you talk us through this one? Uh, I didn't do this one. I did this one. Oh, you sorry. One. I did this one. Uh, <laughs> this is a grubby backyard in Pinewood on a very cold winter's night. It was November. Uh, no, this is, the, this is the big opening scene in the village. And again, it was a big mix of practical pyro. In fact, this is your brother, isn't it? Who yes. was doing the explosions yeah. and bangs in here. Uh, this is obviously Daisy inside the Star Destroyer. And um, that's her, her speeder actually had wheels on it and a small engine, in motorbike engine inside. So she could drive around at 40, 50 miles an hour, um, which is quite cool. Um, Are there scenes that stand out in your memory as particularly difficult in working on Star Wars in particular? Um, uh, for us, it was the beach, uh, the battle, really. Yeah. That was the tricky thing, coordinating all of that and uh, keeping it safe on the set. Um, we actually developed um, an air explosion for, for that, for that f film which was literally a, a, a metal uh, end of a boiler end, uh, end of a boiler. So it's a, about four foot diameter metal plate that we sunk into the ground. And normally we'd put a half a stick of dynamite in it or something to blow a l large volume of uh, sand up in the air. But because we were very near actors and, and uh, extras, we, we made a, a high pressure air cannon that went into it and the first time we showed the director it we actually stood somebody in the middle of it one of our guys and we let it off and it looks like he just vaporized and yeah he said what have you done what have you done and then the guy all the dust settled and our guy just walked out the middle of it so oh, <laughs> amazing so how many takes of this stuff do you have to do too many with that backpack. Do you know what's interesting we did um, it's funny because you film something again and again and again. So th there was this big one-take sequence that Gareth wanted, 
were, you know, running around this backpack through the jungle and, uh, you know, Donnie Yen is kind of like taking people out just every time when I'm about to get caught and is this whole kind of like almost physical comedy action sequence and you're ducking down and crawling and you jump and roll up. And we did that again and again and it was pretty long and it was pretty good, but it, it didn't, it wasn't in the film. In the end, they decided, <laughs> you know what? It's, we need to do something else with yeah. this whole a totally different kind of action is, is happening. So you can do things a lot. And something that's interesting now is like with digital rather than film shooting on film, you know, they used to say nothing focuses the mind like the sound of film moving through that camera. Yeah. It's the sound of money burning, you know, because film stock is expensive. And with digital, I guess the gift and the curse of digital is that you can just keep going. You let yeah. it roll. Yeah. And sometimes as an actor, that's great. You just let it roll. And then we do it. We get to the end and go, okay, go again, go again, go again. And you can loosen up. You don't have to reset. And so it's interesting that in a way, the fact that you've got these guys working at such a high level to make it real means that actually the process of, of filming can now be less stop-start and more fluid than before. So I'd say the number of takes we do now on films if I compare it to an independent movie like Shifty, we did in three weeks on film stock, yeah. it's you know exponentially yeah. higher, <laughs> um, which I enjoy because I like to kind of just continue to tweak things, find new things, but it's not to everyone's taste. Yeah. yeah, but the end result is quite fantastic when you have the collaboration of all the different departments. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's great to. Well, I think that on that note, we'll have to leave it there. So oh if we can, <laughs> uh, give these three a wonderful big round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Thank wonderful. You.